Okay, good to have everyone back with us again. And those of you joining us on television, we appreciate so much the fact that you write and tell us. You feel like you're just part of the class in the studio, and that's just exactly what we want you to do. And uh, as you study with us, and again, we always like to appreciate the fact that everybody has their own Bible, because after all, you go to a secular class, you don't get very far if you don't have your own textbook. And uh, that's all we want folks to do, is learn how to study on their own. And of course, uh, we feel like we're making some headway. Over and over, people are telling us that for the first time in their life, they're starting to study, not just read, but to study the Word of God. So again, we always like to welcome our television audience and thank you for your letters and your prayers, your financial help. And uh, we have, again, just had a thrilling experience meeting people in Denver and Albuquerque and Phoenix. And next month we'll be traveling various other places. And it's always so enlightening to know that the response is pretty much the same everywhere. Now, for those of you who may be wondering, we have all the past programs available on videotape, audio tapes, as well as the little printed books. And if you're interested in any of those things, you drop us a note or call us on the 800 number. All right, this is a Bible study. We don't like to use it, making announcements. So let's go right back to where we left off at the end of the last program, where we had been chasing a whole set of references up through the Old Testament concerning what Paul says up here in verse 2 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, the day of the Lord. Now, if you remember, and as you reflect back on that last program, none of the verses that I looked up concerning the day of the Lord came from Paul. Not a one. They were all Old Testament and as I get into the New Testament then, with regard to this coming day of judgment, I'm not quite ready to drop that yet. I'm going to go back again from 1 Thessalonians, honey, just drop back to the last book of the Old Testament, a verse that we didn't have time in our last program. And so I'm just going to wind up that day of the Lord in the first part of this half hour, because I think I can cover the references to the day of Christ in... Uh, in far less time. But in Zechariah chapter 14, here was my last reference that I wanted to use with regard to the day of the Lord, the day of coming judgment, the coming day of the wrath of God, when the grace of God will have been lifted and his wrath and vexation will come in, not just on Israel, but upon the whole human race, from one end of the world to the other. All right, Zechariah 14, verse 1. Behold the day of the Lord. Same three words. Behold the four words. Behold the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. Now this, of course, is what we have now coined the term the Battle of Armageddon. <clears throat> the houses, or the city shall be taken, the houses rifled, and the women ravished. Half the city shall go forth into captivity, and the rest of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Verse 3, then, see, a time word. We don't know the exact day or hour, but when this moment comes, then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And then that great seven-year period of the wrath and vexation and the vengeance of God will end with the event then of verse 4. And his feet, the Lord Jesus himself, his feet shall stand in that day, that final day of judgment. <clears throat> and it will they will stand upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem, on the east. And then you come on over to verse 9, and this is what follows. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. All right, now let's just move into Matthew 24, and we'll see the Lord Jesus reference to this same day of judgment as he talks to the twelve, in his earthly ministry. Matthew 24. And I've had questions come up more than once about Matthew 24, and I just answered in one 
curt little statement. It's all tribulation. There's nothing in Matthew 24 that applies to us in the church age. It's all prophetic concerning this day of the Lord. All right, and you can pick that up so clearly in uh, verse 3. Matthew 24, jumping in at verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? That is, attendant with his second coming. And what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said, now verse 4, Take heed that no man deceive you. Now when you're warned to look out for deception, what does that mean? Hey, it's coming. It's coming. There's coming a vast deception, the likes of which the world has never seen. Now you see, almost every despotic ruler comes in by deception. All you have to do is go back to the history pre-World War II. How did Hitler gain control of the German people? By deception. He didn't tell them right up front that he was going to be what he turned out to be. He sold the German people a bill of goods. He deceived them. And they, like dummies, swallowed it, see? And then after the fact, then they say, well, we didn't know. Well, they should have. And that's true of any despotic leader. They come in with flatteries. They come in with a lot of promises. Oh, you know, everybody likes to feed at the government trough. You know, I can remember, I think it was Tocqueville, I'm not sure, but an ancient, or not an ancient, but a historian of the last century wrote that America will remain the greatest nation on earth until the common, ordinary, everyday man suddenly finds out he can feed at the government trough. And we're there. And when everybody gets the idea that the government owes them everything they want, then our great democracy comes to an end. Well, Jesus is warning then that there's coming a day of tremendous deception, spiritually, materially, economically, the biggest deceiver that the world has ever seen is coming. And then he goes on and lists in the succeeding verses. Verse 6, you shall hear of wars, rumors of wars. Verse 7, nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Then verse 7, reading on, famines, pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places. That doesn't sound like utopia to me. This is judgment. See, and this is all in accord with all those verses we read in our last half hour coming out of the Old Testament. And then he goes on to say, so far as Israel is concerned, verse 9, they shall deliver you up to be afflicted. It's going to be the greatest persecution that Israel has ever experienced. The Holocaust is going to look like a Sunday school picnic compared to this final three and a half years of the tribulation for the Jew. They will deliver you up to be afflicted. They'll kill you. You'll be hated of all nations. Verse 10, many shall be offended and betray one another and hate one another. In other words, parents will be reported on by their children. Children will be told on by their parents. There, there's going to be no, no one that anybody can trust. Verse 11, many false prophets shall rise and again, what's the word? Deceive many. All right, then he comes over into the, the period from verse 15 on down. But the verse I want you to look at in particular is verse 21, where Jesus himself now, in full accord with all these promises concerning the day of the Lord that we looked at in the Old Testament, now Jesus says, for then, when this day of the Lord comes, then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, which of course took you all the way back to Adam, nothing in those 4,000 years could compare with this day of judgment that's coming on the planet. And then he says, from his point in time future, there would never be anything to compare. And that's why I made the statement, the Holocaust, by comparison, will be rather tame. Now, it was awful. I, I'm not one of those who deny the Holocaust. It was awful. I remember the first time we went to the Mediterranean and we were on the island of Rhodes. 
we met a dear little old Jewish lady who still had the tattooed numbers on her arm. And uh, she shared just some of the horrors of what it was to be in the concentration camps of Nazi Germany. So don't ever believe these people who are trying to deny that there was a Holocaust. But the Lord himself says that even that will not compare with those final three and a half years. And that's reading on in verse 21. There, was, there will be great tribulation as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be future from his point in time until that tremendous day of the Lord begins. Well, I think now we can go back to the book of Revelation and look at just a few of the verses back there that again are in full accord with all these verses we've been looking at with regard to the day of the Lord. Now I'm just going to pick out a few here and there. Let's go first to chapter 16. <coughs> Revelation 16. Where we just have a, a glimpse of all the various plagues that will be coming on the planet one right after the other leading up to Christ's second coming. Now you see, none of these things are attendant with the rapture of the church. None of these things are something that gives a sign that we're going to go. But this is all in concert with the second coming and this tremendous seven year period that we call the day of the Lord. All right, we can just jump in at verse two. The first plague, or as it's called, the first bowl, or if you have a King James, it's called a vial. But it's really a bowl judgment. It's gonna be poured out like the contents from a soup bowl. And there fell noisome and grievous sores upon men who had the mark of the beast and worshiped his image. Verse three, the next one pours out his bowl upon the sea, the oceans, and it becomes as the blood of a dead man and everything in it dies. And so on through all these bold judgments, one is almost worse than the one ahead of it. And then uh, let's bring it all the way down to verse 17, the final bold judgment, which I attach to the Battle of Armageddon. I attach the seventh bold judgment with those massed armies packed into the valleys of Israel, probably in tents, and other than that, almost no protection to the elements. But they're going to be packed in, as I've said back in my Revelation studies, like sardines in the can, contrary to all good military strategy, because the sovereign God is ordering it. And they're going to pack those millions and millions of Gentile troops into Israel. And then, verse 17, the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and there came a voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. Finished. It's the end. Verse 18, And there were voices and thunders and lightnings and a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake. Verse 19, the city, Jerusalem, was divided into three parts. The cities of the nations fell. All the great population centers of the world will suddenly disintegrate. And Babylon, which I call in the book of Revelation that composite of all the nations of the world, this great economic system that we're seeing today, tied together with the internet, tied together with the technology that had to come in order for these end events to happen. And so this Babylon, that great Babylon, that composite of the nations of the world who are in confusion, it came in remembrance before God, verse 19, reading on, to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his what? Wrath. Not his love, not his grace. Now it's nothing but wrath. Verse 20, every island fled away and the mountains were not found. In other words, God's going to totally renovate the surface of the planet. Just like he did in Noah's flood with water, he's going to renovate it this time with other uh, natural phenomena, the earthquakes and the volcanoes and what have you. And then verse 21, imagine these millions of young men out there on the plains of Israel, millions of them, packed in. And what is their doom? And there fell upon men a great 
hail out of heaven. Every stone the weight of a talent or a hundred pounds. Now we know what a five pound hailstone can do. But this is hundred pound chunks of ice. And so they will be literally crushed and ground. And there again is that reference to the wine vat. See? And they're going to be crushed. And then, of course, the verse back there in uh, chapter 14, verse 20, this will be the end result. And when these millions of the armies of the world are crushed with this hundred pound hail and melting probably in the heat of, a, of an Israeli summer, now, I can't prove that from Scripture, but nevertheless, we know that the biggest portion of the year in Israel is pretty hot. And as these hailstones strike, these millions of troops gathered in the valleys of Israel, now you can look at how even the book of Revelation pictures it. Another, verse 18, another angel came out from the altar who had power over fire, and he cried with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. Now, that's, of course, a symbolism of the Antichrist literally putting out the command to all the remaining armies of the world to come to Israel, come to the Middle East. We've got to settle the Jewish problem once and for all. Because, you see, more than one great despot has thought that that was the source of the world's problem, Israel. So I think he's going to put out the command to send your army, send your troops, send everything you've got so that we can finally get rid of this little nation of Israel. Now, always stop and think that when the world is dealing in situations like this under God's heavy hand of sovereignty, the most intelligent can do things ridiculous. Now, we know it's utterly ridiculous for millions upon millions of troops to come to the Middle East to get rid of a little nation of only 10 or 15 million. But I always remind people, when the high priests and the Romans consorted to go and arrest Jesus down there in the Garden of Gethsemane, timid and compassionate as he was, how many foot soldiers did they send to arrest him? Anybody know? Well, if I'm not mistaken, it was 600. See? I mean, it's ridiculous. Ridiculous. If it wasn't 600, it was 100. I, I didn't look this up. I wouldn't intend to use this. But see, this, this is the ridiculous of men's actions that we say, well, common sense says they won't do that. Well, I know that. But they're not going to use common sense. They're going to just, by the work of God, they're going to be packed into those valleys of Israel like grapes into the wine vat. That's the analogy, see? All right, now then reading on in, in Revelation 14. <clears throat> so the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth. Now that's just simply God's way of bringing the armies of the world to the valleys of Israel. Gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. So God's going to bring these millions of troops under idiotic commands of their generals to encamp in these valleys. Now, if you've been to Israel, you stand up on Mount Carmel, you can see the valley of Israel on just laying out there as flat as a tabletop. You get along the Mediterranean and you got the Valley of Sharon, just as flat as a tabletop. The Hula Valley, the Jordan Valley, these are all flat areas, see? And so as these troops are just packed in there, then comes this final bold judgment, the hundred pound hail, which becomes God's way of treading his wine vat. Got the picture? Symbolism, yes, but it's a literal truth. Now then, what's the result? Verse 20. And the wine press, these valleys full of men, was trodden outside the city. See, these valleys are all up north of Jerusalem. And blood, not grape juice, blood came out of the wine press, even to the horses' bridles. And for the space of 1,600 furlongs, which if I understand right, is about 180 miles, that river of melting ice and blood will just find its way out of the valleys of Israel and head down to the south, all by the wrath 
of a sovereign God. All right, now then in Revelation, come over to chapter 19, and the final, final event of the wrath of God is the second coming. That will end this seven years of tribulation. Revelation chapter 19 and drop in at verse 11. Revelation 19 verse 11. This is the second coming and I hope you remember our lesson last taping on the rapture. None of this is part of the rapture. The rapture is just the trumpet of the Lord sounding and Christ comes down, brings the soul and spirit of the departed believers. They're reunited with their resurrected body there in the air. We're translated and we all go up with the Lord into glory. Never even touching the planet. No judgment associated with it. No catastrophe, no disasters. But oh, at this one, that's all it is. Now verse 11. The final event of these seven years is, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. Now I always have to stop here. I do not think that Christ is going to come riding through the air on a white horse. But the symbolism, which of course Revelation and Daniel and Ezekiel use extensively, the symbolism is his coming in power and victory which, of course, all despotic emperors did when they would come into a conquered city. They loved to ride on a white steed just to show that they were victorious. All right, so the symbolism is giving that same effect, that Christ is coming now as a conquering emperor, which, of course, the ancients were only too well aware of. And so he comes, according to symbolism, on this white horse, but he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness. See, remember what I said in the last program? This isn't an unfair God. This isn't an unjust God. These millions of tribulation people have had the same opportunity for salvation that you and I have had. But what have they done with it? They've walked it underfoot. They've had absolutely no concern about the things of God. So whenever someone says, well, how can a God of love be so cruel? I say, look, God spent all of his cruelty for the human race on his son. Christ suffered like you and I can never imagine for the whole human race so that God could offer salvation to everyone, rich or poor, black or white, oriental or western. He could offer that salvation free for nothing to anyone who would believe it. And then we say he hasn't got the right to judge those who walk that underfoot. You better think again. He has every right in the world. He's just, he's fair. In righteousness, see? not in hatefulness, not in bitterness, but in righteousness he does judge and make war. Then verse 12, his eyes as, not flames, they weren't burning flame, but they were so piercing it was like, I think like, like a welder's torch. And his eyes were as a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And that's that reference again to the wine vat. Not his blood, his victims. And his vesture is dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. All right, and then the armies which were in heaven, which I have to feel are you and I as members of the body of Christ. The army does not necessarily mean it's a system of warfare with weapons. It's organization. See, and Paul makes it so plain that all the saints are in a tremendous organization. The body of Christ is an organism with organization. And so all these people in distinct places of organization who were in heaven, followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And we find over in verse 8 that that's the 
clothing of the saints, that white linen. All right, and then verse 15, and out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. Now, he's not holding a big Roman sword in his teeth, not even a little dagger. But the sword of the Lord is what? His word, see? His word. He speaks the word and the hail falls. He speaks the word and these armies of the nations disappear. He speaks the word and all the birds and the vultures come and devour the residue. All right, so the sword of the Lord, which is the word, he smites the nations, see, in his wrath and in his fury. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Stark language, isn't it? And then people like to just smirk and say, I thought he was a God of love. He is today. He is a God of grace today. The vilest sinner. We had the most tremendous testimony in uh, Albuquerque, wasn't it? Just blew us away. I don't know if I got time to share even the highlight. He had gone through a lot of bitter experiences. He had come to the place that he cursed God at every chance. Cursed him. Went home and found every Bible and tore the sheets out, threw them in the fire, and cursed God with every handful that went in the fire. A few days later, he caught our program. And this is what's so amazing. A few minutes into our program, he heard me speak of the grace of God. And God opened his heart, and that young man, probably around 40 years old, was saved there on his living room floor. He said, I cried out, God, I know I'm a sinner. Now, that's what God's mercy can do. Oh, he cursed God. He hated God, see? But where sin abounds, God's grace abounds more. That's today. But here, this is the wrath of God, and he treads it alone. And then verse 16, this says it all. Why can he do it? Because he has on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings, Lord of lords. He's sovereign. He's in total control of everything. And his wrath will fall because of his sovereignty. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding.